Hi there, uh, welcome along to Dare Academy meets Henderson Logie. Uh, I am joined this afternoon uh, by Stephen Bain and with Grant Snedden, who both work at the firm and they're huge sponsors of the Dare Academy. So we're really pleased to have them back for their fourth consecutive year in the competition. So how are we gents? How are you? Very good, thank you, Stuart. Yeah, good, thanks. And a um, little bit of background information. I did this on my research in advance of making this video. So um, a little bit about, about uh, Henderson Loggie. Uh, they are an independent Scottish accountancy based firm with offices based in Aberdeen, Edinburgh, Glasgow and here in sunny Dundee. And they have recently went through a lovely rebrand. So kudos to the marketing team who I know will be watching this video. And Henderson Loggie have been supporting businesses for over 100 years, uh, starting, starting up way back in 1909, which is a solid indicator of um, a quality business. Um, and they've been huge supporters of the Dare Academy, like we say, and um, we're really pleased to have them back in the competition. So um, Stephen Bain uh, is the finance and IT partner at Henderson Loggy and helps with a wide variety of SMB businesses and heads up pertinent to this competition, the business, uh, the businesses, games and digital sector group with a particular focus on startup games companies, which is obviously a huge interest to our own Dare Academy finalists this year. And also uh, Grant, Grant Snedden is an assistant tax manager who I know works with Stephen and I know has a lot of experience in dealing with game studios and startup businesses. So how about that for the intro guys? That's okay, I've done my research there, haven't we? Yeah, yeah so good. how did you know all that? <laughs> a little bit of research oh, there. God. So um, firstly, since it's a games competition, I'll start with yourself, Stephen. How big a role has computer games played in your background and in your household? In my household, so um, I've, I'm of an age where where um, computer games were pretty basic when I was growing up, um, but but nowadays with with two sons, one of fifteen and one of ten in the house, um, there's 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 a lot of computer game interaction. Um, Dad's not often allowed to get get his hands on the consoles, um, and if I do, I'm easily beaten. <laughs> But it's it's great to see. It's great to see, and you know, somebody my age just just really sees the the difference in, in what what we did as youngsters and what what the kids are growing up with nowadays. It's just just amazing the technology that they have to hand. Absolutely, and yourself, Grant? Yeah, fairly big part. I mean, I remember kind of getting hooked when I was younger. And um, the first game I remember having was uh, FIFA '98, which was on the PlayStation. Um, so you could probably guess my age based on that. Um, but even till now, I still play games at night with my friends and stuff like that. It's a, it's a good way of uh, social interaction, I think. And so I would say it has formed quite a big part. Henderson Logie, uh, we know that you guys are you know, really vested in the, the game sector. So if you could tell us, Stephen, just a little bit about the stuff and the, the work that you guys do um, in the games community and the sector and how you um, generally help help startup businesses. Yeah, sure. So we, we've got quite a... Go, go back a number of years, uh, really till to, to, to the time when the games companies were really first coming to the fore in, in the city. Um, a lot of experience helping these companies and great, some great success stories of taking some very, very small startup businesses and being with them um, through all stages of the, you know, from, from a, a small startup who needs a bit of support here and there. Um, they put in touch with lawyers and bankers, some startup bookkeeping advice, payroll advice, um, accounts and tax, just all the usual things that you would you'd help a business with. Um, now, as, as in any sector, some businesses grow quickly and some some less so. Um, but but we've had some some real success stories where you see a business growing um, and exponentially and then at some point being sold on or getting investment from somebody else um, and, and, and people making a lot of money at the sector as well. Name drop one current one we're working with is Conglomerate Games. And Conglomerate Games is, is it's very current. Um, uh, the, the Courier Business Award winner, multi-award winner. Um, I actually I met Jamie through the, the Courier Business Awards, but which we sponsor as well and was just taken by by how, how good the, the game was that they were trying to develop for cystic fibrosis. Um, and and, and there, there's a, st still a, a small early stage business, but somebody who's really, really going places. Um, and, and it's great. That's a great example of, of taking somebody, come, you know, a graduate coming out of the university um, and they're on a, a, a real journey to something much, much bigger. How long do you think it's been that you guys have been like a key player in the, in this sector? I would say since the sort of mid nineties. 
since his gaming really began to become a yeah, big, big thing in the city and um, we acted for some clients at that time. Um, and as you know well, the the gaming community is, is one where everybody talks to each other. Um, I think there's a real collaboration among different developers. Um, they don't really see themselves as competition to each other, um, but they collaborate really well and, and they speak to each other. And yeah, I think our name quickly got known as kind of the, the firm of the go-to firm to go and go and help them out. And, and what's been interesting as well in recent years with things like Grant knows better than me, but things like the Video Games Tax Relief, which is a government initiative. Um, it's you know the, even even sort of ten years ago that that wasn't there. Um, but that that's another big big draw for for companies to come and speak to an accountant and, and tax advisor and get get some specialist advice because there's money there's money out there to be had um if if, if you you know if, if you make the right applications grant how about yourself what are you passionate about in terms of helping uh, new game startup studios and uh, start startups in general which i know that you so you can notice them yeah i think from our side it's just good watching these companies grow um i mean we've been involved with the dare academy for a few years now so we do often see startups coming from there uh startups coming from the university or even startups where they've maybe been employed for another games company and they've gone away and done their own thing created their own game and it's just watching that grow and um, especially with dundee being such a such a hub uh, for games and um, there's plenty of studios in dundee Aberdeen is obviously one of the main universities for um game development courses um, and there's the potential now with the, the eSports arena um, coming in Dundee so I can only really see that getting bigger. Reflecting on the circumstances and um, of the pandemic, how have businesses changed in your experience over the last 12 to 15 months and have you seen more studios start to pop up since they've been perhaps working remotely or um, have you seen more startups? What's your, what's your take been on the last 15 months or so? Yeah I think, uh, I think the gaming sector is probably one of the areas that have haven't stumbled at all um, because there's obviously a lot more people at home now who are probably going to turn to playing games especially if they've been furloughed or something like that and um, so the gaming sector we've seen growing where, where other companies might be cutting back on staff or furloughing employees and um, many of the games companies we act for have actually been taking on staff in that time and um, so it's it's just one of one of these sectors and um, i think it just suits the fact that there's more people sitting at home playing games just now and um, for anyone who's developing a game that's exactly what you're looking for and um, the only stumbling block or one of the main stumbling blocks is probably the creativity and um, so whereas before you might all be sitting in an office space and you can sort of bounce ideas off each other and um, some might get approved some might get knocked back Whereas now when the guys are working at home, it's probably a little bit harder um, for that kind of collaboration. Um, but in general, the, the sector seems to be booming at the moment and I can only sort of see it getting better. Yeah, I think, I think that's, that's, you know, we, we all know having having done many kind of um, online calls over the last 15 months, um, they have their place and it's it's fine like, like this interview has been done done remotely um, and, and it's okay. But you don't, you don't get the same sort of bouncing ideas off each other as Grant says. Um, uh, by the same token, you get some positive feedback and I've spoken to one or two people who say when they really, you know, if it's, if it's a designer or a programmer needs to just get their head down and focus, um, then, then there's a benefit to that as well, because you can just, you've got no outside distractions, you can just, just sit and get on with your, your work. But it's a collaboration piece, I think, is the bit that's missing. But as Grant says, it's a sector that's, you know, in terms of um, sales revenues is just, just growing so much at the moment. Um, I think more people getting into games as well. So sort of the the traditional kind of thinking of, of who played computer games, what computer games is all about, is changing as well. Um, different demographics, age profiles, um, um, it, it, you know, I think must be must be good for the industry, and you see that you see that in terms of the application um, for the, the Dare Academy as well. The diverse the diverse range of games that's been produced as well. I think I think there's still a bit of a feeling um, among people who don't really know much about the sector that the games is all about like driving fast cars and shooting each other, um, but there's so much more more to it, and a lot of educational games, um, whether it's to help help children with their, their learning, help with mental health, there's some some great things out there, um, and it's it's really refreshing, you know, when you have a call with a potential new business. Um, and, and the first thing we always do is oh, tell me a bit about your business. And the passion that comes out of these these startups is just just great to hear. I'd like to pick your um, brains now about um, games tax relief. Something that you touched on before, 
So it's obviously a tax relief for games, but I'm clearly no expert. So can you give us a little bit of enlightenment about what that is and how that could benefit, you know, a, a new startup game studio? Yeah, um, the tax relief is uh, really beneficial, um, especially for startups, because normally funding is probably something that a startup will struggle with at the start. It's like they might have a great idea, but then where does the money come from to develop it, to pay themselves like while they are developing their games? And so the way the tax relief works is that first of all, the game has to meet certain criteria with the British Film Institute. Um, it's fairly straightforward to meet that. You, it can be done on the gameplay based on like the characters, the language of the game, but if not, it can also be done on the developers. So where they're from and do they have like a European passport, that kind of thing. Um, but the relief itself works in that essentially the company would get 20% back on what they spend. Um, so there, there's some variances there depending on what else happens in the year, but roughly speaking, if a game if a game studio spent twenty thousand pounds in the first year, maybe just like paying paying themselves a salary, and uh, the company would get four thousand pounds back, and um, so that's money that can just be reinvested in game development or obviously paying themselves, paying subcontractors, and um, but we found that's pretty vital for startups when when um, funding is normally normally an issue to begin with. So how do they go about um, acquiring that? Is that something you would help them with? Yeah, it's something we can help them with. Um, so the first stage would be going to the BFI um, to get a certificate for the game that they've developed. Um, we found the BFI have been quite useful if there's any queries, but um, we can also help with that process because um, we've been through it quite a few times with various different clients. Um, once they've done that, um, they would make the claim as part of their yearly accounts and tax compliance. Um, so accounts and corporation tax returns need to be filed on a yearly basis. And the claim for VGTR would be part of that. So if, if the company's first year end was just, for example, December 2021, um, they would have to file accounts and tax after that. And at that stage, they could then apply for the apply for the tax relief. Um, so they, they, they might have already developed like a part of their game or they might have developed their whole game by the time it comes to claiming the relief. Um, but it still helps with cash flow. I mean, if they want to put into like a new development or a new project, um, the money's, money's there to be claimed for them. Um, Stephen, I just want to ask you if we go back a slight step is so if someone um, come up to you, namely one of these Data Academy teams, hopefully, and they ask you, how do I set up my game studio? What advice would you give them? What processes do they have to go through? And what steps do they have to take to set up their game studio? Yeah, so the first thing to think about is probably the legal structure of the business. Um, we, we would, based on what Grant was just saying about VGTR, we would recommend setting up a limited company because it's by being a limited company and um, that you fall into the corporation tax regime. And it's through that dream that you can then claim the VGTR. Um, so whereas trading as a partnership or sole trader may be, may be attractive from a saving on you know, compliance costs of having to do annual statutory accounts, um, it is more than outweighed by, by the VGTR if, if you're developing your own game. Um, so, so setting up a limited company is probably the first thing to to, to do, think about you know who the directors of the company are going to be, what the shareholding structure would be, um, and and to do that as a, as an online process nowadays, it's it's reasonably straightforward. And in our experience, most most businesses when they come to us have already done that. They've already set up their company, and they've had that initial thought. Um, and then they come to us and say, "What do we need? What do we, you know?" It's it's a bit daunting if you work with games developers who don't know much about the the commercial side of things. So, what do we need to do in terms of um, how we're going to pay ourselves some money? Um, if if you're lucky enough to have some some um, capital in the business, uh, you get some investment, and you're going to take some cash out of the business, um, you know should should we take out, take it out by way of salary and what are the payye thresholds? Should we pay ourselves dividends, and, and and that's the type of conversation we can have with the clients and, and advise them. Again, just going back to the VGTR side of things, um, salary will attract the tax relief, whereas take a, a dividend won't do. So there's some some important things to consider at that stage. Um, if you are going to run a payroll, then you need to register for PayYE and, and keep proper records. Again, that's a service we can offer for a, a fairly fairly low investment every month. And then we always we always have a talk about keeping accounting records and keeping as much information as you can. And that can be anything from a like an online accounting system just down to a simple spreadsheet. Um, initially, there may be very few transactions, um, but as, as the business scales, you want to be ready to, to grow with that. Can you tell us about your involvement in Tiga? Yeah, so we're a member of, ta of 
um, they, they, they caught Tiger actually. Um, but so um, we've we've um, been, been a member of that for a number of years now. We've we've um, um, thrown some sponsorship money at them as well. Um, what was interesting because I I went down to the the award ceremony back in November 2019, um, when we did win the the tax and accounting firm of the year award. And what was I, I went there myself. Um, so you know a massive room of people, um, and you just place at a table. But what was really interesting when you said you were from Dundee, and and mentioned you know Aberty as, as kind of good friends of ours, everybody knew the name. Um, I was at that table mainly of people from Staffordshire University, and there was, there was a huge respect for for the the, the name of Aberty and all that's come out of there. Um, so so although although we are we are the firm of Henderson Loggy may not be particularly well known. Um, down in the London marketplace, and uh, when you start talking about games in the city of Dundee, it's it's amazing to to see how how that how well known that is. Looking at um, our six finalists this year, and you know we're really hopeful that they're going to have a really positive year, and they might want to continue post competition. What advice would you give them as a startup studio or a startup a head start? What would give them a really positive head start in getting into business? I think uh, first thing I would just say to stick at it. I mean, it can be pretty tough to start with, especially if you're at university or you've potentially got part time jobs and um, you've got this idea, but you still need to find the time to develop it. And um, what I would say is the rewards are there. And um, if your game is good and you can take it to a publisher or whoever who also agrees and um, the rewards are certainly there. So yeah, stick at it. Um, something I would say for the games industry as a whole, and we've probably touched on it already, is the networking element. Um, so that you don't sort of need to do this on your own. You can go and speak to people who were in your position maybe three or four years ago. They maybe went through Dare Academy themselves. Um, they'll have sort of three to four years of experience now, um, and they'd probably be able to answer any initial queries that you have or probably help you with any sort of elements of your game. Um, and I think, again, in our experience, we found them to be pretty approachable. Um, it's quite a close knit group and I'd be surprised if you contacted someone for a bit of help and they said they were too busy or didn't have the time for you. Um, most of them will be pretty, pretty available for help, I would say. Um, so yeah, just use them, use their, uh, use their knowledge, use their experience um, and it'll help you on your way. And Stephen, apart from, you know, eating beans on toast, are there any tricks that can help, you know, a startup studio save some money in those early years that you were reflecting on earlier? I think I think it's just to be to, to be frugal in terms of the way you run your business. Um, you know, the last fifteen months of the pandemic has shown how how working from home can be very effective, and actually a lot of, a lot of companies will start up. Um, you know, maybe working out of bedrooms. Um, it's, it's it's pretty uncommon actually to go and for, for a new startup with three or four people to go and and, and get some space. There, there are some some relatively. Um, Good, good places out there. You can go and get accommodation. I know Aberté in in the past has been, you know, has offered space to people as well. Other than other than kind of your your people cost, your next biggest cost is kind of property. So if you can do something remotely, um, then then that, that's that's going to save you money right away. The other thing I would add to Grant's point as well about um, networking, it's not just networking in terms of looking for help um, and and experience. You know, you can have the best game in the world. But if nobody knows about it, it's never going to go anywhere. And the most important thing we think is, as with any business, you've got to take your product to market in some sort of way. Um, so it's you need to knock on doors. You need to be speaking to the right people. Um, and that's where some of the, the big the big players who've made it before in, in the local industry um, can give you a fund of advice as to, to what to do, how, how to pitch your product, how to get your product known in the marketplace um, in, in the right people. And don't don't be put off either. You know, I think I think some people might get knocked back one, once or twice and think, oh, this isn't going anywhere. If you really, really believe in your game as a product, then, then keep pushing it, keep doing it and um, you know, speak speak to the right people and, and just just really believe in yourself and, and let others believe in you as well. Are there any common mistakes that you see startups go? And I mean, you touched on there that, you know, they might get one or two closed doors on them and give up. Um, is there any other common mistakes that you see startups making? I think it's, yeah, it's, that that would certainly be one is, is is giving up too soon, um. But it's also it's also maybe a lack of focus. You know, starting something and thinking this isn't going anywhere and jumping on to the next thing. You know, it's 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 you know if you're developing a game and um, it's appreciating it, it's going to take a long time. 
um, and you can't get kind of three quarters of the way through and then move on to the next product. You've, you've got to keep going with what you've got. Um, and an another mistake would maybe be not asking for help. Um, you know, if it, it's unlikely for a, for a small startup, you're going to have all the skills um, yourself. You know, you, your background might be in animations and, and design. It might be programming, but you might need um, somebody who's who's good on on designing the music. Um, you know, so so don't be prepared to to go and speak to somebody and ask ask for some subcontract work um, to, to give you the expertise you need in the areas you need it. Moving on to the the Dale Academy competition, just I suppose to sort of round, round off our conversation. Um, what are you most looking forward to seeing this year? I know we're in such difficult circumstances or very different circumstances than we'd be used to, um, because we obviously used to be able to invite you all in and you could play the games at some point, but that might not be the case. We're not sure yet. But what um, lasting piece of advice would you give um, these these teams? I think just just give it your all. Don't don't. Don't don't use the pandemic and the fact that you can't really go out and about as you freely would like as an excuse not to just throw yourself into it and give it your all. Um, there'll, there'll be plenty of opportunities to put your games up online and to let people see you've done and really just just sell. You know, put your heart and soul into it. And when it comes to pitching your game, really, really sell it with your heart and soul. What about yourself, Grant? Yeah, I mean, I think it's clear that the talent's there just based on the on the YouTube trailers. Um, you can see there's a lot of good ideas, there's a lot of good design, and um, there's obviously a lot of sort of programming and stuff that also goes into that. Um, so the skill set's there. Um, it's just working at it, making sure you can come away with the final piece. Um, there might be might be times where you think it's not going to work, or there's too many sort of bugs and things like that, and it's never going to get to a phase where it's ready to sort of be played by the public. Um, but just persevere, persevere, and I'm sure the, the end product will be good. On that note, Stephen and Grant, thanks so much for taking time out today to speak to us, and um, we we'll look forward to seeing you in the near future, hopefully in person. Yeah, thanks, Scott, and good luck to all the finalists. Yeah, thanks, and good luck to everyone.